on the subject of liberation for our people. Because of his love and dedication to the liberation and salvation struggle of the downtrodden, the grassroots, the street gangs, and the black masses in general, he is loved and honored for his strong, bold, uncompromising principles stand the world over. You can hear our brother on the world famous popular rap group Public Enemies album, It Takes a Nation of Billions to Hold Us Back. Public Enemy tells the world of their tremendous respect for Minister Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad and how he has been a great inspiration to them in their climb to the top of the chart and in their great quest to raise the consciousness of the black masses. You can see and hear him on Public Enemy's Fight the Power soundtrack video for Spike Lee's blockbuster movie, Do the Right Thing. The rising rap star Ice Boys in the Hood Q of America's most wanted and promising bright star of mega movie Boys in the Hood says Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad opened his eyes and taught him what time it is. You can hear him on Cube's new album called Death Certificate. Since the mid-70s, he has been a presenter at colleges, universities, and major international conferences around the globe. He has traveled and lectured extensively throughout Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. He has served as Minister of Defense and Supreme Captain of the elite force of men known as the Fruit of Islam. For under the directorship of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, he has served as national spokesman and international ambassador of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. He's held the portfolio of national assistant and is walking in the footsteps of both Minister Malcolm X and Minister Louis Farrakhan. Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad serves in the same role in the black movement. He has served as Minister of Muhammad Mosque No. 7 based in Harlem and in Brooklyn, New York, and presently serves as the National Assistant to the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. He is a member of the Honorable Marcus Garvey UNIA's uh, American Communities League, African Communities League, pardon me, this revolutionary scholar of national and international recognition is a member of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations and has lectured on most of the American campuses and in Nigeria, Egypt, Ghana, Libya, South Africa, Uganda, Canada, England, France, and Italy, and has hired and inspired audiences in universities all over this land. So I am asking us to get ready to hear a man That's right. who specializes in spiritual and urban guerrilla warfare. Courage is his badge of honor. Uh -huh. right. Discipline is his hallmark. Uh -huh. The one idea that keeps his heart beating from one second to the next is that the day that our enemies will be brought down to the soles of our feet Woo! is an hour that has gone down. Will you join me in welcoming the national This gentleman is Bill Garland. Can you please make a presentation? Assalamu alaikum. Brother Collins, I mean, it's a good thing that Mr. Perry did not show you that. Because as, as usual, you were always more than prepared. <laughs> Last time the Minister Farrakhan was in town, I heard him speak of the Sons of Thunder. The Sons of Thunder. This is your war act.
In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the world. I bear witness that regardless to land or label or language, there is but one God. All right. We thank that God for coming as it was written and prophesied that he would come. Yes, sir. In the scriptures of the Bible, we are told that he would come seeking that which was lost. We can find no other people fitting the description of the lost brother, the lost sister, or the lost sheep, except we, the 50 million or more mentally and spiritually dead black men and women here in the hells of North America. Yes, sir. So we thank Almighty God, Allah, for coming. Yes and finding one worthy yes. among us yes, that's right. yes, that sir. he could put himself into that one and make him his black revolutionary messiah yes. in the midst of a people who are downtrodden, yes. robbed of their name, their language, their religion, their culture, their God, their folk ways, mores, and norms. And by the way we act, many of us act as though we've been robbed of our own mind. And so he has come among us, the Messiah of Almighty God, Allah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes. We turn the sound. And we thank him for his apostle, that one that we believe is the anointed and appointed yes. for this hour of the liberation and salvation of the black nation. Yes. I speak of none other than the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in their name. Yes, sir. I greet you right. A mafia, free to land, there it is, and black law for all black people. To the Reverend Ralph Blake of Mother Zoe United Methodist Church, and to the family of Mother Zoe, we thank you so much for inviting us into your church home and opening your doors and opening your arms and opening your hearts to us and giving us a place of refuge from the storm and the wiles of the oppressor and the enemy who wants to lie but does not want the truth to be told of the lie. To Brother Martin Dias of the Black Student League of the University of Pennsylvania. To Minister Rodney Muhammad, the Philadelphia representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And to you, my beloved and beautiful black brothers and sisters, it is indeed my honor. I was hoping that the devil himself would be here. I was hoping to look him in his cold blue eyes. Yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. I was hoping to sit here and stand here with him tonight and feed him to the black line. Yes, but I guess he knew he would be coming into a lion's den. Yes, sir. And he knew there would not be one likened to the son of man in the lion's den with him. No. And so he didn't come. <laughs> if you knew him, you would know why we must honor him. Malcolm was our manhood, our living black manhood. <laughs> this was his meaning to his people. And in honoring him, we honor the best in ourselves. And we will know him then for what he was and is a prince, our own black shining prince. I want to say that every prince comes from a king. I want to say that we become prince and princess in a royal divine line by virtue of a king and a queen that rules from a throne. I want to say to you here tonight, and this is a forum even with the devil not here, this is a forum that we should have on this day, right. on the birthday of El Hajj Malik El Shabbat, on the birthday, May 19th, 1992, of Minister Malcolm X, mm -hmm. because 
Minister Malcolm X, El Hajj Malik, El Shabbat. Mm -hmm. His life is an exemplary life. Yes, sir. His life is a life that is caught up in the liberation struggle of his people. Yes, sir. His life has positives. Mm -hmm. His life has negatives. And we must learn to draw from the lessons of the negatives and draw from the ne lessons of the positives that we might be a strong, a positive, a powerful, and a productive people, but a balanced people. No man or woman's life can be really studied until after they are gone on and the period is placed behind their testament. Then we can study them after they have gone on. Then we can begin to analyze them and see them not as we would like to see them, but see them as they really are. All right. Nobody can take anything away from Minister Malcolm X. Nobody can take anything away from El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. Even at this late hour in his physical absence, a movement is coming up in the streets of America and reverberating around the world based on the teachings that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad put in his head, in his heart, and in his soul. And so Elijah speaks through him. I'm going to talk to you here tonight. Come on, go ahead. Go ahead. We will have a question and answer period before it's over. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to you here tonight, and I'm going to go into some things that perhaps some of you have not heard before. But we want to study the life of Malcolm X. Because this is a life that is the absolute axis and the pivotal point at this point for our unity. Because it was in the 60s on that life that a great split and division took place in the black nation. When Malcolm left the nation of Islam, when Malcolm split with his teacher, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Republic of New Africa was born. Mm -hmm. When he split, the Panther Party was born. Mm -hmm. When he split, it was a split that caused us organization to be born. And we saw a young black man, Dr. Comrade Huey P. Newton. Right. We saw a young black man, Dr. Maulana Karen, right. who gave us the Nguzo Saba and gave us Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. We saw at that split, we saw the Republic of New Africa formed by Brother Gaidi and Brother Imari Abubakari over there. The life of Malcolm X was the pivotal point for our division and our splintering and our scattering during the 60s. And when the Malcolm Riddle is solved, when the Malcolm problem is solved, then the black nation can begin to come black together again. I want to acquaint you with what is called COINTELPRO. Right. COINTELPRO is the counterintelligence program of the FBI of the United States of America. That's right. <laughs>
will deal with what happened that day, Sunday, February 21st, 1965, in the Audubon Auditorium when Malcolm was assassinated. We will deal, brothers and sisters, with Bruce Perry's argument that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was jealous of Minister Malcolm X. We will deal with whether the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is an immoral man or a moral man. Right. We'll deal with all of that and then some before the night is over. Come on. We have taught that of all our studies, yes. history is best qualified and most attractive to reward our respect. That if we know what happened to us yesterday, we can intelligently discuss today because today is built on yesterday and tomorrow is built on today. Right. And if you know what went down yesterday, you're not likely to let the same thing go down today. <laughs> History that's qualified to reward our research. Minister Malcolm X, yes. born Malcolm Little. All right. Let's go to the blackboard with some white chalk. <laughs> Somebody have to hold it. Malcolm, what? <laughs> Malcolm Little. We sing a song in the church. There's a man going around taking names. All right. <laughs> Prior to meeting the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Our great brother Malcolm X didn't know that he needed an X. Right. Now, Bruce Perry wants us to believe that Malcolm was so much smarter and wiser, and some of you in the audience believe that, oh, yeah. and we will explore it before the evening is over, and he will teach you the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. But you don't understand the African brother. Right. African proverb says the old man sits down, sits back, looks all around, and sees everything. While the young man he jumps up, runs all around, and sees very little. The old man roots run deep. Malcolm was Malcolm Little. May 19th, 1925. Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Bruce Perry attacks Malcolm's family life. That's right. He attacks Malcolm's father. <laughs> he attacks Malcolm's mom. He attacks Malcolm's brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. He attacks Malcolm's grandparents. Malcolm came, like most of us, from a dysfunctional home. That's right. The Bible says that we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. What are you talking about, Bible? We are born in the sin of the white man's world and shaped after the iniquity of the white man's world. You have to have a dysfunctional home. When you come up a slave in a strange land among a strange people who oppress and afflict you for 400 years, Night and day. Yes. So we understand Malcolm Cole. Yes, sir. We don't have to keep the spotlight in Come Malcolm's on. living room. We don't have to keep the spotlight in the home of Malcolm X. Right. The old devil wants us to believe that Malcolm's father was not a great minister, that he was not a great leader in the UNIA, African Communities League of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah God. Hey. He wants us to believe that Malcolm's father was a shiftless man, that Malcolm's father was a selfish man, that Malcolm's father would go out and eat and get his stomach full and leave his family at home starving the crap of Satan. That's what I say. <laughs> leave his family at home starving, he said. He said Malcolm's father wasn't killed by the Black Legion, Come on. the Ku Klux Klan of that era and of that particular region. He said Malcolm's father was simply in a, in a big hurry to catch one of the trains. <laughs> and he ran up to it and he was so clumsy until he lost his footing and slipped, mm. fell down and busted his head, got his leg almost cut off, and laid on the track and died. Almost. And when he claims he went and talked to the cracker police, 
policeman. Now, how are we going to believe this crap? <laughs> we just got through looking at a video <laughs> of something that took place March 3rd, 1991. <laughs> Hell, we all know what we saw. So when the verdict came down, the verdict came down not guilty for the poor crackers. Persino, Wynn, Powell, Goon. That was Coon and the other Goon. <laughs> These gang bangers. Who the hell? Uh-huh. the Daryl Gates gang. Now he goes back and interviews a lying policeman who must be old as hell. So that means he's an old seasoned liar. Been lying a long time. And ask him what kind of police report was filed when Malcolm's father died. He said, well, I took the report. He said, no. Oh, he wasn't no Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> wasn't nothing like that. <coughs> he said the man fell down and bust his head and almost got his leg cut off. That's all happened to old, old Earl. Wasn't nobody trying to hurt Earl. <laughs> Bruce Perry said that Malcolm's father was no threat to the white man. Wait a minute. You're not teaching the teachings of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah God. Right. You got no threat to the white man. Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey taught one God, one aim, one destiny, Europe for the Europeans, Asia for the Asians, and Africa for the Africans, at home and abroad. The Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey taught race first. Race first. I'm going to say it again. Race first. Some of you
Reverend Earl Little is in the minutes of the movie. All right. Is in the minutes of the chapter the of that particular the chapter that he headed up. They don't say that he was a drunk. They don't say that he was a woman now. In fact, this Bruce Perry says that Malcolm challenged the most honorable Elijah Muhammad because he didn't have an opportunity to confront his father for being a skirt chaser. And he claims that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad was just like Malcolm's father. So he challenged the honorable Elijah Muhammad because he never got that opportunity earlier with his father. And that the two male role models in his life, that both of them were immoral men and no good. Let's look at it. Let's work with this thing. We're gonna, you're gonna have to sit back and buckle your seatbelt. This is the that we gotta work with. Yes, sir. He was called Malcolm Little. But he met a man that told him that he was not a little man, that he was a big man, that he was not only a big man, but that he came from the people who are absolutely the father and mother of civilization, the gods and goddesses of the universe. And so when he met this man, Elijah, Elijah changed his name from Malcolm Little to Malcolm X. Malcolm X Little. Why X Little? Come on. You wearing the X cap? You wearing the X t-shirt? You wearing the X sweatshirt? You waiting for the X movie? And here in Philadelphia, you eating your X potato chips? Right. You got X underwear? X lingerie? You're really getting deep with the X. <laughs> but what does the X mean? Right. It's not good enough to wear an X that was made by a Korean. It's not good enough. The X means unknown. Right. Unknown. You saw Dr. Haley's root. Our names are unknown, brothers and sisters. We didn't come here Harry McGillicuddy. We didn't come here Jim Danby O'Hulahan. We didn't come here Abraham Lincoln Culcutt. We didn't come here Johnny May Hamburger with lettuce and tomato. We didn't come here to teach them. These were names that were given to us by our former slave master. Give a plantation we were all we had to wear the name of the cracker who owned us. We were on the Johnson Plantation, and every nigger, as they called us, on the Johnson Plantation had to wear the name of a cracker named Master Johnson. If we got sold to the Smith Plantation tomorrow or next week, every nigger on that plantation had to wear that cracker's name. You remember Kunta Kinte? How his name was changed to Toby? You remember Fanta? And you remember the crazy names of Fiddler and Chicken Jar that were given to us by the white man in slavery. We are the only people in the world, brothers and sisters, that wear somebody else's name. You say, what difference does it make? I don't want to wear no X. What difference does it make? A rose is a rose by any other name. You call that rose, do, do, long enough. It's going to start stinking. <laughs> name is very important. When you hear a name, a name determines an entire social order. A name determines an entire social order. I'm in the reception area. You're the executive. Mm. I buzz you and tell you that Mr. Pling Ling is here to see you. A social order revolves around in your head. With Mr. Pling Ling is Mrs. Hong Wong. And with Mr. Pling Ling and Mrs. Hong Wong is Mr. Fuyong. <laughs> A social order begins to revolve around in your head. Right after they leave, Mr. Francois Boudreau comes. Mm -hmm. right. Social order revolves around in your head.
Okay, go ahead, Tyler. After Francois Boudreau, Mr. Pedro Gonzalez, and Maria Martinez come in, a social order begins yeah. to revolve around in your head. But when it's a people representing the slave and the slave master, you don't know if it's the black brown or if it's the white brown. Come on. Some of you walking around, you blacker than the ace of space. Some of you walking around, you're so beautiful and black until you're purple black, blue black, blacker than 150 million midnights. Hair so beautiful and nappy until it looked like a million black power fists standing up on top of your head. But you're running around here in Philadelphia talking about, I'm Mr. White. This is my wife, Mrs. White. Where did you get a name like that from, boo? These are the names of your former slave master. And so Malcolm received his X. X not only means in mathematics, unknown, but X means no longer. X means used to be. X champion, X president, Malcolm X Little, the former slave of a white man, the ex slave of a cracker named Little. X means no longer, and it means unknown. But the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan teach us that the X also means after 400 years of slavery, suffering, and death, that the X also means the unknown quantity mm. and the unknown quality yeah. that are locked up in the breast, in the chest, in the soul of the black man and black woman. And it means that like an atom, you have to be cracked, and that which is in you must germinate and burst forth yeah. from you that we might again be a free, proud, and productive people. X means unknown. Yeah. But now you're wearing the X. All right. You just saw the X and got X sighted. <laughs> but you're here in Philadelphia, and you don't want to come to Minister Rodney Muhammad right, and the right. X spurts.
of the white man's work. Yes, Brothers and sisters, Malcolm X, at that point, he started trying to get a grip on himself after his father was gone. After under the pressure his mother broke like so many black mothers who have to carry the burden and the strain and the pain of being in hell for 400 years. And so she broke under the pressure. According to all records, a strong woman, a beautiful woman, a woman that held the family together. Other accounts say that Reverend Earl Little had gardens in his yard that he would plant and she would tend to. Bruce Perry being a fool attempts to attack this when this is African culture, fool, was going on right in Malcolm's household. As Malcolm started moving in the streets and he started moving like many young teenagers do, he started a burglary ring. In fact, Bruce Perry says that he met a man, a young man, or he's not too young now, that he met a man named Malcolm Jarvis. Right. And that Malcolm Jarvis had been in prison with Malcolm for six years. First, the old devil, the old no good cracker. First, he says that one of his students, by the name of Cora, I think her name is, Cora Spencer wrote a term paper on Malcolm X. And it was Cora Spencer's term paper. It was so good. He said it was what? So good. It was what? So good. He said it was so good until he called her in. I'm here tonight to tell you that her term paper was not so good. Her term paper was too good. And her term paper was glorifying a nigga and it was lifting up a nick, and Bruce Perry couldn't stand Cora Spencer writing a term paper that was not so good, but too good, and honoring a black man. And so Bruce Perry, for a moment that appears to be a moment of preparation for a crime of passion, driven in his soul, driven in his nature, hateful, Outraged, yeah. enraged, mm -hmm. full of rage. Yeah. He was compelled to go out. He read the autobiography after she had asked him if he would. She said she had to go on to law school and she couldn't continue that research that he was asking her to continue. And so he read the autobiography as it is called of Malcolm X, written by Dr. Alex Haley, mm -hmm. who I had the honor of meeting with just a few months before his passing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he read the autobiography. He said, this is, this seems too good. But he says it was by accident that he went out to do just an article or publish something on Malcolm. And there he ran across the prison records of Malcolm. Well, you know you don't just run across the prison oh. records. <laughs> You gotta go and do some work. They got pictures in this book that we're gonna burn before the night is over. They got pictures in this book of a little snagger tooth Malcolm X. Right. I mean, they go all the way back to Malcolm in knee That's right. That's why when they start asking me questions, I say go and research. All right. Go and find it for yourself. But in the meantime, bring me the best that you got that uh -huh. you say you've already heard. And I'll show you that what we got from Elijah Muhammad and Louis Farrakhan uh -huh. will confound all of them and absolutely shut them up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Malcolm left his little black girlfriend and he started hanging out with a little white girl. And then he was in this little white ring. Their boyfriend got wind of this or husband, or whatever they were, the white men. Yeah. Ultimately, somebody dimed Malcolm. Malcolm, a young man, ends up on his way to prison, look like he might have to spend eight to 10 years in the penitentiary. While he's in prison, he's gone through such a life, and during his entire life, you all know, during a certain phase, he was called D. 
Detroit Red. He was called the great hustler in the streets. Bruce Perry says he was never a great hustler. In fact, Bruce Perry does not give him credit for really anything. He makes us believe that he's writing a book about the life of a man who changed black America. Come on. That's to get you to buy the book. All right. You shouldn't buy the book. That's right. You should leave the damn book yeah. on the bookshelf. Right. If one of you has already bought the book, then that one book should be passed around to be studied. But don't put any money in Bruce Perry's pocket. Right. Right. Let the pepper wood stop. He wants 2495. <laughs> you go re-assassinate Malcolm, <laughs> re-kill him, yeah. re-murder him, and then make us pay for it. $25 for the book. If you already know a book, again, share it, pass it around, study it, analyze it, critique it. We must do that. Develop the argument to answer the book. But don't run to the bookstores to buy this $25 garbage on Malcolm. Not only does he trash Malcolm, his father, his mother, his grandparents, his uncle, his aunt, his brothers, his sisters, he attacks Adam Clayton Powell. He attacks the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Anybody that meant anything to us, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, he attacks us in the book. Well, we don't have to pay for that. Let us move as quickly as we can. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Malcolm went away to prison. He was called Satan in prison. They said Malcolm was so mean and so evil until they gave him the nickname Satan. They didn't say he was a coward in prison. As Bruce Perry tells us, Malcolm was a coward and a homosexual. And then he tries to say, but my book shows you how he grew out of a coward and a homosexual and became this great transformed being. But he knows it's just like in a court of law. Once you have entered certain facts or certain evidence or certain lies into the record that the jury can never forget that. They don't think just about the transformation. They think about everything else you told them leading up to the transformation. All right. All right? Yes, sir. He's wise enough to know that. Malcolm's brothers and sisters heard the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And they went to Malcolm telling Malcolm about this great black man who had touched their lives, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. This fascinated Malcolm because his father, Reverend Earl Little, was from Reynolds, Georgia. And now he was hearing about a man who was from Sandersville, Georgia. They told him, Malcolm, the white man is the devil. All right. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad says, Malcolm, that the white man is the devil. Not a devil, but the devil. There's no devil under the ground. There's no devil under the ground with no red pantyhose that's going to stick you and kill you with a barbecue sauce. The devil is on top of the ground. Malcolm said when he heard from his brothers and sisters from the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that the white man is the devil, he said it was like a light bulb that came on in my head. He said, everything became clear to me. I could see everything and put it in its proper perspective. Then Malcolm stopped smoking in prison. He stopped drinking the prison brew that was being made behind the wall. He stopped getting high with the behind the walls high that they were passing around. He began to clean his life up. A moral teaching came to Malcolm a teaching that would give him in prison the meiotic balance that his life was missing. So Malcolm was no longer called Satan anymore. 
They started calling him Brother Malcolm in prison. He started organizing all of the men in the institution where he was. He started reading the dictionary, reading everything in the dictionary. He increased his vocabulary. He'd read every book that he could get his hands on. He was obsessed with something. Something was compelling him. He was being prepared in a classroom to do a work that he didn't even know about. So Malcolm was in school. But when Malcolm got out of prison, very few organizations would have accepted Malcolm. That's right. Very few churches would have accepted All Malcolm right, right. and given Malcolm a platform to speak from. But the most honorable Elijah Muhammad took him in like a father yeah. would take in a son. Right. He taught him face to face and mouth to mouth. He taught him sometimes day, sometimes night. All right. And Malcolm began to drink from the fountain of supreme wisdom of God's divine Messiah in the midst of the people, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Right. This turned Malcolm on. Malcolm, with an eighth grade education, and the honorable Elijah Muhammad, with a third grade education, on his way to the fourth grade, with the eighth of Malcolm and the three of Elijah, they put America in the 11th hour. The students The son, spiritual son, learning from his spiritual father. Yes, Malcolm, rolling out over America, Detroit, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. ultimately New York. Mm -hmm. Malcolm started teaching and organizing an articulate art mm -hmm. with a silver tongue, right. with a golden voice, mm -hmm. and a persuasive manner that did not allow you to get around the word of the messenger of God, yeah. but the word of the Messiah of God. Mm -hmm. You say, well, that makes Malcolm smarter than him. You don't know your book. <laughs> Some of you go to church and don't know about it. The scripture tells you that Moses, the liberator, was a man slow of speech and slow of tongue. And God had to reprimand him and say, go on in there and deal with Pharaoh. Who made your mouth, Moses? Who made your tongue, Moses? Yes. And if there's a problem, Moses, you've got Aaron there. Make Aaron your minister. Aaron became the spokesman and the mouthpiece for Moses. In the seventh chapter, I believe it is Exodus, it says that God Almighty made Moses a god over the people. And Aaron became his messenger, his man or spokesman who would carry the message to the people. Moses was made a god over the people by Jehovah God, according to the seventh chapter of the book of Exodus. But Moses needed a mouthpiece. That's right. He had the wisdom. He had the guidance from God. He had the spirit, but he needed one who could articulate it in the language of the people. All right. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad turned Malcolm loose on all, all across America. Malcolm gained popularity while the teacher and the father was in the headquarters. You have to know this man, Elijah Muhammad. What kind of man he yeah. was and is. Yeah. He could sit down in his living room That's right. Yeah. That's right. and send you hundreds of miles away yeah. That's right. to look at farm land. Yes, sir. And you dig your hand down into the land and maybe bring him back a little bit of the soil yeah. or the dirt, and he would tell you, buy that and Ooh. how much you should pay for it. Muhammad yes, sir. ship rolling yes, sir. to Lima, Peru, South America. Uh, yes, sir. Ship rolling on the high sea mm -hmm. to Japan, yes, picking up appliances to bring them back into the black community yes, at a reasonable price. Right. <laughs> Elijah Muhammad right. had ship rolling, uh -huh. sailing the high seas, going into northern Africa and Morocco and bringing back cargo for the black community. Mm -hmm. Elijah Muhammad right. had cargo place. Elijah Muhammad would sit in his living room yes, sir. and purchase passenger planes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Elijah Muhammad would sit in his living room. 
sit right there. Go ahead, Brother T. Send them out and tell them what to do and how to do it. Yes, that's what right. What they would meet with and how to overcome it with it. That's right. Malcolm was his point man. Mm -hmm. Malcolm was the best that he had. Yes. Malcolm was like the big brother over all of the believers oh. and all of the men. Mm -hmm. And Malcolm had a young, precocious, powerful minister out of Moss number 11 in Milwaukee. believers are, quote, 
to be forgiven if they renounce hypocrisy. There was also a declaration that Allah specifically chooses for his mercy whom he pleases. Yet in the next issue, Elijah Muhammad dwelled at considerable length on the faith of hypocrites. He singled out Malcolm, whom he called the chief hypocrite, for particular criticism. He has said everything imaginable against me, Muhammad declared. I will never forget. Though Elijah goes on, Bruce says, though he predicted painful chastisement for those who defied him, he admonished his followers, he admonished his followers not to kill hypocrites, not to kill disbelievers, mm -hmm. not to kill, in other words, Malcolm X. Right. A decree went out throughout the nation of Israel right. Teach on it, to all of the ministers and all the captains of the nation of Islam Jeez. to leave Malcolm X alone. Yes, that's right. But now we've talked about COINTELPRO or the counterintelligence program of the FBI, FBI a minute ago. Mm -hmm. In J. Edgar Hoover's counterintelligence program of COINTELPRO, it says we must stop the rise of a black Messiah. Right. We must do what? Stop the rise of a black Messiah. We must stop the rise of a black Messiah, right. J. Edgar Hoover said, who can unify and electrify the masses of black people. He says, how will we stop this Messiah? We must discredit him. We must misdirect the followers who follow him. We must do everything we can to neutralize him or to destroy his movement. He says that the denial objective of the FBI, the denial objective of the United States of America is to make sure that this black messiah who can unify and electrify the militant masses of black people to make sure that Pan-Africanists are so confused about him, are so hateful toward him until Pan-Africanists won't even come in. The denial objective is for black nationalists, the counterintelligence program of the FBI said. The denial objective is to keep black nationalists away from this revolutionary black messiah. The next denial objective, according to the FBI files, and pass me this book on, on the FBI files, the FBI files go on to say that the denial objective of the United States of America is to make sure that black youth That's right. do not fall in love with and follow this black messiah. How you gonna do that, Mr. White Man? We're gonna discredit him. We're gonna misdirect the people. Yes. We're gonna tell lies on him. Gotcha. In fact, the FBI in its counterintelligence program has what is called Operation Dirty Tricks. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Dirty Tricks Squad. Mm -hmm. What do they do? They write letters. They send letters out to various members creating confusion in households. That's right. They send letters from the FBI to the wives of different leaders, the way J. Edgar Hoover called Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in and said, Martin, if you don't back down off of this thing, we got some tapes of you in bed with another woman, and I'm going to send it to your wife, correct? But Dr. King didn't talk out. That's right. Dr. King said, I'm going on to do what I got to Right. You get your tapes and go on to do what you got to Operation Dirty Tricks. Mm -hmm. of the FBI, COINTEL PRO, counterintelligence program of the FBI. They say we must stop black youth from following this one. How you going to do it? We're going to put $30 million behind a movie That's right. called Malcolm X. Woo! So that millions will flock to the movie. Yeah. I have the entire yeah. script. I don't believe anybody in here got the entire script. If you got the entire script, raise your lying hand. <laughs> I've had the entire script for a long time. In fact, by God's grace, I had the entire script when many members of the cast didn't have the entire script. Bruce Perry ain't the only one that can catch this very. Somebody else can get over to the other side too. And in the script, somebody said they might change that part. The movie was opening up with Malcolm X, Denzel Washington, rolling over, turning over in 
the bed with a white woman. That Malcolm in bed with a white woman. Now I hear that there's another scene where Malcolm is supposed to be tonguing a white woman in a taxi cab. The Jew behind the scenes. You go give thirty million dollars to praise now from Yeah. 
what I'm here for. Yeah. Like, ha, 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 ha. Go ahead, right. You up? <laughs> hey, you need a race. Come 
here to conduct a Dale Carnegie course. I came here to tell the truth, right. whether you like that or not. If you wanted the Dale Carnegie course, when you got the 12th and Mellon, you made a right useful living. That's right. You're in the wrong place. I came to tell the truth here tonight. Because if we can resolve the Malcolm River, if we can solve the Malcolm problem, then the black family can and all of the rifts and division and enmity and confusion that we can ferret it out if we can solve the Malcolm problem. Because there is the crucial problem at the heart, the core of the black nation's disunity right now. And we're back to J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI file because he said he would create a situation and a set of circumstances that would so enrage you and confuse you about whatever the program would be of that day and the key leader of your day, the Messiah of your day, until you would back away from him. We want to have nothing to do with right. Listen to that. He's working his plan. Yes, sir. Yeah, every day. And some of the most conscious among us yeah. are caught up in the plan. That's right. And don't even know that you caught up in the plan. That's right. Huh? Yes, sir. Come on. Wait a sec. You don't know this one. Yes, yes, sir. You get angry with us when we tell you that he's the devil. Yes, sir. Come on. You get angry with us. Yes, sir. The devil is a wicked, evil, smart, crooked deceiver. Yes, the devil is not always one who just come in talking crazy to you, mowing you down and killing you in cold blood. The devil is also sneaky. Yes, sir. Right. Tonight. Yes, sir. Slip, yeah. right. deceit, uh -huh. underhand. Yeah. He's the master of a science called trick yeah. 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 He has made tricks and lies a science. Yeah. He's a past master. Come on, yeah. Tell me I'm not. No. <laughs> Black as I'm supposed to be. Yeah. Christmas time, I walk in the supermarket. And I'm walking down the aisle and I hear, <laughs> I take my four steps down, I'm,
wrap it up quickly. So Malcolm, brothers and sisters, Malcolm, roaring out all over America, teaching. Now, a major event takes place. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the president of the United Snakes of America, who yeah. Malcolm called Old Foxy Johnson, being an old tricky Johnson. John Kennedy gets assassinated. The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad sends out a communique to all of his ministers, saying, do not make any mention of Kennedy's death in the public. Leave that subject alone. The ministers who are here today, Minister Kadir from Newark, Minister Jamil from Baltimore, Minister Conrad from New York, Minister Rodney here from Philadelphia, and other ministers who are here. We received a similar communique from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan during the so-called Persian Gulf War. Yes, sir. We were told make no mention of it in public, cancel right. all college, right. university, That's and right. public speaking. Right. Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. Malcolm was the only minister that broke though with those instructions. You say, well, he, what do you mean? He got to follow everything he said? <laughs> what he say. <laughs> Malcolm said, Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, taught me what I know, made me what I am. Yes. And if you would listen to the tapes of Malcolm X unedited, every other word or sentence almost, he said, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us. Yes. Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us. Yes. Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, Mr. Muhammad teaches us, but now they've edited the tape. That's why they go up and come down and fade in and fade out. You say, what's the happening with this? They take all of that out. Right. Let it out. How do we know? We got the original tape. Better listen. We got the original tape. Better listen. You can order them from the Final Call newspaper. Uh huh. We've got Malcolm's original tape. Let Malcolm's own tape. Malcolm, in his own words, speak for himself. <laughs> Bring Malcolm to the witness stand. Malcolm believed in the establishment of an independent, divine government under God and black nation for black people called the kingdom of God that is to be established here on this earth. He believed that black people are the chosen people of God because this is what he was taught by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and that we would be the cornerstone of a new world order. Not that stuff Bush is talking about. <laughs> and so Malcolm believed that he was a minister. Not an imam alone, but in, inherent in that, you can also find the duties of an imam, but he's minister. He poured himself yes. into that. Yes, yes. Yes, he did. Yes, sir. That's right. Yes, he did. Yes, sir. Malcolm spoke at Manhattan Center in New York. He got through his lecture fine. He made no mention of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, but there's at least one devil in every crowd. Right? At least one. <laughs> Like this? Come on. The devil comes to see how wide awake you are. So that he can go back and report. The niggas are waking up. You <laughs> went, Bill. They almost tore the roof off the place down there, Bill.
Jesus was talking about when they talked about in the scripture referring to Jesus. They called him the good shepherd. Yeah. They say the good shepherd is not a hireling. That's right. He's not just there for money. The good shepherd will watch over the black sheep. I ain't talking about no rap group. Or that. Great general, great posse, our army back in the 
him up, caused a lot of casualties and fatalities among our people, killed men, women, children, and babies. We got him in an ambush. We got instructions to wait until we see the white of their eyes. We got instructions to wait until they're within 75 yards of range. One of the zealots in the group sees it. He's so excited. He's so emotional. He's thinking about the blood of our men, our women, our children, and our babies. He's about to do the right thing. And he's about to do it at the wrong time. He's 150 yards away. The order was wait until he's 75 yards away because the one who gave the order is a strategician. The one who gave the order is a master of the gift. The one who gave the order understands maneuver and maneuvering and strategy and terrain. He understands the order of war. Yeah. The one who gave the order understands that when you're fighting the enemy, that you make a noise in the east and you strike in the west. Oh, yeah. The one who gave the order understands that you avoid strength and you strike weak. Woo. The one who gave the order understands that when the enemy appears to be strong and powerful, sometimes you appear to be weak and appear to retreat. But when the enemy appears to be weak or asleep, you advance and take it. within rank yes, and wait until you see the white of their eyes. Mm -hmm. All right. But the zealot fires at 150 yards. He strikes the great general dead between the eyes and kills him. But the rest of his troops turn heels and make another maneuver and they're out of range and out of reach. If he had waited till 75 yards and got him struck at that point, we would have got the general and we would have gotten all of them who have caused so much hell and havoc and heartache and pain and hurt among our people. So Malcolm fired his shot. His shot met the mark. His shot was on top. But he shot at a time when he was told to hold his peace. So the most honorable Elijah Muhammad called him in. He reprimanded Malcolm. The head of the nation yeah. called his diplomat in, called his statesman in, called his ambassador in, right. called his minister in. Yeah. Because uh, Malcolm was about a government. Yes, sir. Malcolm wasn't with no club. Yes, sir. Right. Malcolm wasn't with no organization alone. Right. Malcolm was building a nation yeah. under his leader and teacher's guidance yeah. from Almighty God. Yeah. So Malcolm went in to meet with his teacher and the leader of the nation, the head of the nation, the President General of the nation. He went in to meet with the Commander in Chief. Commander in Chief said, Malcolm, you broke with orders. Yes. You broke with instructions. I'll have to silence you, Malcolm, for 90 days. That's right. I won't put you out of the nation, but I want you to be silent for 90 days. What does that mean? Um, that means you can talk, but you cannot speak publicly nor to the press, nor in the mosque number seven in Harlem at 116th and Lenox Avenue. I want you to be quiet for 90 days, Malcolm. Now what does the teacher have in his mind? At the same time, the teacher is testing Malcolm. You see, it's easy to walk with a man in the cool of the day. Hard as hell to walk with him in the heat of the evening. If Osaji Fokwami Nkrumah would have tested the loyalty of his followers before he went off to Hanoi in Vietnam, when he came back in 66, I believe it was, then there wouldn't have been a coup. If Patrice Lumumba had tested the loyalty of his followers and he knew them and put them under test and trial, Patrice Lumumba would not have been such an easy target for the United States government and the CIA back forces that ultimately killed him. Come on. Man. Every wise leader must test the loyalty right. of their followers to see where they are. All right. If you rub this way, which way will you go? If you rub that way, which way will you go? If you do this while I'm around, what will you do after I'm gone? So Elijah Muhammad tested. Malcolm took the 90 days, but the white man was working on it. Yeah. What you don't understand is this wicked beast. You don't understand this damn devil. Psychiatrists, psychologists, voice stress analysts would study Malcolm, watch him on TV, listen to him on the radio, ask him this question, ask him that question, ask him this question another way. How does he answer? Put it on the scale. Let's see how his voice, intonation of his voice. Let's see how he answers. Does he? Think
psychiatrists, psychologists, board stress analysts, they studied Malcolm. And they determined his strengths and his weaknesses. And they determined how to exploit them. And so they started <coughs> making fun of Malcolm. They said Elijah Muhammad has spanked Malcolm X. He set him in a corner, put a duck hat. Him. They started working on Malcolm's ego. Yeah. At the height of Malcolm's career, Listen. he was sat down by his teacher. Teacher watching. Why did you do him like that, Elijah Muhammad? Because I want Malcolm to sit in my seat while I'm going. When I leave off of the scene, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad would say, Malcolm is the man that I trust over the nation. Malcolm is the man that I trust the salvation of my people with. I've taught him more than I've taught anybody. Teach, I've spent more time with well, him than I've spent with anybody. Yes, else. sir. Yes, sir. So now I've got to test him for character. Quirk. Right now. Character flaw. Yes, sir. i got to probe the depth of his soul. Go ahead, Colin. i got to see if he's worthy of sitting in the seat. Come on. Follow me. Come yes, on. sir. Go ahead, brother. So he tested me. And they worked on him. But at the same time, J. Edgar Hoover was working too. That's right. Come on. FBI agents came in and put on white shirts. They were already there. We've got FBI files that go way back that's to right. 57, 54. Oh, Bruce right. Perry says in his book here, Bruce Perry says in his book that the counterintelligence program on the FBI didn't even <coughs> stop page 373, that it didn't even start until two years after Malcolm. <coughs> well, they might not have called him Cointel Pro Fool. That's right. <laughs> uh, same flavor, just a different label. <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover was on the Honorable Martha Mosiah Garvey. That's right, right. Before there was an FBI when he was working under the Justice Department. That's right. He later made the FBI. So yeah, you can say Cointel Pro, but the likes of Cointel Pro already in effect. Boom. All right. Please bear with me. Take your time. <laughs> please, please, we're almost there. The thing that I'm going to touch tonight, you've never had us to come in front of you and get on the hot seat and go into these issues with you. Yes. All right, now. That you wanted to question us, or question us all and probe us all. I'm going to leave no holes barred. And during the question and answer period, whatever you want to ask about uh, his domestic life, the secretary, the necker, and all of this, his the murder, the assassination, you'll be welcome and free to do that. Okay. Malcolm decides, Malcolm decides that there's also pressure in the house. And there was pressure now. FBI agents had started putting on white robes and headpieces, white shirts and suits and bow ties and string ties. They were saying, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Some of them were men. Some of them were Cap, blue cap, quad, section leader. Some of them were over the bank in the University of Islam. Some of them were in the secretary's department with all of our records and bookkeeping, sending it straight to the end, right in the ranks of our people. These tall, these boot-licking, butt-licking tall, these rats and stew pitchers. You see them out there in Los Angeles. Telling and snitching on our brothers and sisters. If you weren't in the rebellion, if you weren't in the revolt, then that's your business. But if somebody else was, you keep your mouth shut. You don't go down in 911. These snitches, agents, joined all of the black organizations. They joined the Civil Rights Movement, FCLC, the Urban League, NAACP, FBI agents right inside the organization. Then there was some chicken-hearted, jealous-hearted niggas <laughs> in the nation of Islam. <laughs> Just weak niggas. <laughs> Just evil niggas. <laughs> Just jealous niggas and envious of the great Malcolm X, <laughs> saying as alaikum, <laughs> inside of the nation of Islam. 
he gone. Malcolm would speak all over the country. And you couldn't read nothing in the Bahamas Speak newspaper. It was though he wasn't saying a word. But the New York Times would have him in the New York Times. What is it here? The Philadelphia Inquirer would have him. The Baltimore Sun would shine on him. All of them. L.A. Times would write about him. The Sentinel, the Herald Dispatch, the Baltimore, was it Afro-American? They would write about him. The, the Amsterdam, I'd be damn new. they write about him. <laughs> All of them would write about him. But the Muhammad Speak newspaper, which Malcolm X helped start, they wouldn't write nothing about Malcolm at that time in the newspaper. This hurt Malcolm. He was working his heart out. And he didn't understand what was happening. Then, while he was busted during the 90 days, they all converged on him. Everybody now, because the big man was down, they closed in on him. Picking at him, jugging at him, talking about him, undermining him, talking behind his back, backbiting him, calling him a hypocrite. Come on. All of this. Malcolm left the nation of Islam after 90 days. He said, I'm leaving the nation of Islam, but I will be back. But I feel that I can do more right now from the outside than I can do from the inside. And so he left. He started the Muslim Mosque Incorporated in the Teresa Hotel. Then later he started the African, the OAAU, the Organization of African American Unity, to separate the religion, as he said, from the politics. That his religion was Islam, and his politics was black nationalism. Malcolm had now started on something that had been worrying him for a while, but he had somewhat forgotten. Way back, Malcolm wanted to marry a sister in the nation. I won't call her name here, but we all know her. That know her. And quite a few of us in here know her. Malcolm wanted to marry her. This is before Sister Betty. Dr. Betty Shabbat. And this is to take nothing from Dr. Betty Shabbat. Malcolm was such a man, so caught up in the struggle and the movement, he didn't do things in an ordinary way. Like everybody else, they were just free and just free, fancy, free running around. He was committed. So Malcolm got her, got her on the staff in Chicago at headquarters at our black house and didn't tell her really that he wanted to marry her. He just put her there, he figured for safekeeping, put her in the safe deposit box. <laughs> he go on back to the trouble. When he had a minute, he'd go back and get her. But the next thing Malcolm heard was that this sister that he loved dearly had become a wife of the most honorable Elijah <laughs> He could have halfway dealt with that because maybe he would have still held on to some hope or dream that he could have still got back. But then he found out that she was pregnant for the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. You with me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we showed you. No. <laughs> what took you so long? That's what I've been waiting to hear. Yeah. Let me sit up here. <laughs> That's the way we are. We just as crazy as that. Somebody can come with all kind of wisdom and science that will make us free and independent. We'll get both. You don't seem like a boy like that, but we will. Somebody can come to you and tell you, do you know that so-and-so just discovered a cure for AIDS? <laughs> Not only that, but they're working on something that will make the condition of black people with the sickle cell trait much better. They come to you and say, do you know that so-and-so like little boy? You say, what? Like little boy? Tell me about that. That's right, brother. We just fill it. That's right. That's right. Silly as hell. Yes, sir. Believe in rabbit's foot and all kinds of things. Believe in a rabbit's foot is good luck. The damn rabbit had four, but they weren't good luck. You believe in anything. 
me in the wrong. Because people who think it's all right to do wrong and all wrong to do right. That's us. So, Malcolm, brothers and sisters, in love with this sister. Now she's pre pregnant for his father and his teacher. This is like a dagger in his heart. But he didn't tell his teacher. He didn't make his teacher to understand before any of this happened what his desires were. His teacher had no way of knowing. So his teacher marries the only woman that he loved at that time. And he probably never forgot her. But Malcolm understood scripture. Yes, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the most honorable Elijah. Right, right. A man who Bruce Perry was not an immoral man. All right, now. No man who inspires such morality and ethics and righteousness and clean living in a people as Elijah Muhammad could be an immoral man. That's right. Did he have other wives? Yes. Did he have little teenage girlfriends? No. Right. Malcolm understood the scripture. Plain, Malcolm understood the Bible. Come on. Malcolm understood the Holy Quran. Right. The Holy Quran says that a Muslim man in the East, we don't practice it here in the West, yeah. that a Muslim man in the East can have as many as four wives under certain conditions. Yeah. It is not the rule of Islam, it is the exception according to certain conditions, war and the desperation of the rights of men and the like, and so that women will not be left just in the society. It is every woman's God-given right to be loved to be, and to be able to love and to be secured and maintained and to have the relationship of a divine family, <laughs> if that is her choice. So polygamy was established as an exception and to correct certain social problems and social ills. <laughs> Malcolm understood this. According to the 33rd chapter and the 66th chapter of the Holy Quran, right. it says that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, the Prophet Muhammad of 1,400 years ago in the desert of Arabia, the Arabian Prophet Muhammad, I want you to get these two Muhammads, straight. The Muhammad of 1,400 years ago in Arabia, some reports say he had 11 wives. Some reports say he had 9 wives. Malcolm understood this. It says that Prophet Muhammad married a 9-year-old girl named Aisha. But they say he did not have a relationship or conjugal relationship with her, some scholars say until she was 11. Some say she was 13. I say, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Divine mm -hmm. and spiritual. 
his teacher because he was personally hurt. Personally hurt. Mm -hmm. He attacked his teacher. And the son of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, Wallace D. Muhammad, is the one who led him into that. Yes. <laughs> While it's D. Muhammad, brought a couple of sisters to Chicago also that became secretaries. Thank you, John. We know them. I won't call their names. He wanted to marry one of them. Next thing he knew, all of them were the wives of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And this hurt while it's Muhammad once, twice. <laughs> I mean, he was hurt, 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 if you know what I mean. <laughs> but he, under, he understood Bible and he understood that Holy Quran. But these were personal feelings. Yes, sir. Personal, this was personal pain. Malcolm could handle it all those things. And then Malcolm started getting angry with his teacher for setting him, sitting him down, for sitting him down at the height of his career. And so then Malcolm and all of the hypocrites and the envious ones and the jealous ones and Muhammad speaks, wiping him out of the news and all of that, it started hurting him. And then Malcolm stood up and Malcolm started going among the followers. He called in Lord X. He started telling him about the most honorable Elijah Muhammad having other wives and having children for those wives. Well, look, let's get this straight. If the man had wives, having children is automatic. Right. I mean, that's a moot subject. Right. The purpose for having wives, fool. Right. Yo, what's up? such and such, and that the messenger, and the dear apostle, has these wives, or these secretaries, and that he has children by them. What do you think, Brother Lewis? Yeah. Brother Lewis X, now Farrakhan, from Boston, Massachusetts, he said, I think that there's no God but Allah, Amen. and Muhammad is his message. Yes, sir, that's what he said. That's what he said. He His answer, because that's his little brother. <laughs> Young Lewis X said he left crushed, mm -hmm. hurt, almost destroyed. He didn't know what to do. He went home, he said he couldn't sleep. He saw his wife sleeping in the bed. He said he just wished he could sleep like she did. Mm -hmm. Something told him to go and get his Quran. He went to his holy Quran and he opened it to the 33rd. Yes, chapter. sir. Yes, yes. sir. He started studying and he went to the 6th. After he jumped up, got transportation, and went back to meet with his big brother, Malcolm. That's right. He said, I got it, Brother Malcolm. I got it, Brother Minister. I found it in the Quran. I found what the prophecy says about the messenger having more than one wife and having children in the section in the Quran on the domestic life of the prophet or the messenger. Yes. Malcolm would say, I know that. That's right. He said, but you can't handle it. Yes, sir. He said, you leave that alone. Yes, sir. You let me teach that. That's right. And then he looked at young Louis X. And he knew that Louis X was going to report him to the teacher. And he said to him, if you would just hold up, Brother Louis, with your report to the message. No, he said, Brother Louis, don't tell anybody what I told you. Yes, sir. And young Louis X looked at him and said, I won't, Brother Minister. Nobody. But, but 
the middle. Right. Now, Bruce Perry takes this to mean that Louis X had turned on his friend. No, sir. Turned on his big brother. Yes. But the little brother might have felt that if the father knew, he could help the big brother That's before it was too late. That's and so he went and told the father. Ultimately, he told the father, Malcolm asked him to let, her, let him get a letter off to the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad first. So it comes to the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad's attention, what Malcolm is saying. Later, Malcolm went all out into the world. He went on radio. He went on television. He went on white people's shows. And he sat with white people and talked about what the man that he knew was the devil, was his enemy and his father and teacher and Messiah's enemy. He sat with them and told them the inner workings of the nation of Islam. You've heard some of the tapes. You say the black Muslim movement, Elijah Muhammad and the black Muslims, they're doing so and so. Elijah Muhammad and the black Muslims inside of the black Muslim organization, they're doing so and so and such and such. Some reports say that he even met with the FBI and gave them certain reports about because he wanted to crush that which had hurt him. He became bigger than the movement. All right. Bigger than the struggle. Bear with me. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. And so ultimately, every Muslim became a potential murderer of men. See, you don't know what that's like. That's right. You've never loved a man. Right. The way the Muslims love Elijah Muhammad. Yeah. Right. Right. You've never been committed to anything that hard. You've never been that rooted in anything. Right. You've never believed that strong in anything. Right. Elijah Muhammad told us to go and lay down at the airport, at the Philadelphia airport, and peak traffic with all the planes were landing. You find us on our way to the airport to lay down. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah. That's right. He told us to go in the judges' chamber and hit somebody. Find us stepping off in the judge's chamber. Right. 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 That's right. We put him under our arrest. And arrest the judge too if he gets in the way. Right. right. You've never been a part of anything like that. Right. So when Malcolm went out and attacked his teacher, every Muslim became a potential murderer. But they were all under the instruction, leave Malcolm alone. Right. But agents. FBI agents, we know you're here tonight. We know you're here. We've been looking at you. We can tell the way you part your hat. We can tell the kind of grease you use in your scary curve. Your wig is crooked. Tilt it to the left. Straighten it up. Careful how you move your hands. <laughs> you rest and snitch on the legitimate aspirations of your people, your people who are yearning to breathe free. That's right. You used to get away with that in the city. That's right, Doc. But in the 90s and in the 21st century, make it plain. Make it plain. if we can't bring you around, we're going to put you in the ground. <laughs>
are told to leave Malcolm alone, but there are agents in the nation of Islam in key positions. Yeah. The FBI files bear witness. Yeah. That's right. They bear witness. Right. So they were spreading other talk in the nation. They were saying, look, Malcolm should be killed. Look what he's doing to the man. You already got your instructions. Your instructions from the leader, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, is leave Malcolm alone. So February 21st, 1965, Malcolm is to speak at the Audubon Auditorium. A week prior to that, his home was five bar bar. Malcolm had started saying that it was the Muslims who firebombed his home. You've seen him on video saying He said the Muslims were trying to kill him. But at another point, July 1964, Malcolm was at the Cairo Hilton. At the Cairo Hilton in Cairo, Egypt, or Kemet, and Malcolm was food poisoned in Cairo. Not K Royal, sorry, it's a little further than that. And Malcolm had to be gotten up at the, they had to get him up in the middle of the night and pump his stomach out and rush him to the hospital. He was the only one food poisoned in the Cairo Hill. Malcolm started saying, according to Haley and others, that the CIA and government intelligence had him under an international conspiracy, and he started seeing agents following him and popping up with him all over Africa, the so-called Middle East, and everywhere he went throughout Europe and the United States. So Malcolm said, when he got ready to go to France, he went to France, February 9th, 1965. They wouldn't permit him in France when he had been there. There were rumors he was going to be assassinated. And the French didn't want him killed, no French saw. It was said that the CIA had put pressure on France to keep him out of there. Malcolm said, this is bigger than the black Muslims. Right. He said, I know the black Muslims. He said, when the black Muslims come to kill you, can't nobody protect you from a black Muslim except another black Muslim. He said, but I help teach the black Muslim I have practice. I help teach them. And I know how they move. And this is bigger than the black Muslim. He said, I'm going to stop accusing the black Muslims. This is the government that's after me. Right. Malcolm is talking about, had talked about taking America before a world court, right. taking America before the United Nations. That's right. Some of you make a big thing out of that. Jesus. What is that? That's right. Go, Go before the United Nations. Go ahead. I understand it. I respect Malcolm wanting to go before our brothers and sisters. Wake us up. But the United Nations is a paper time. Yeah. Right. The United Nations has no teeth. Right. United Nations can't enforce anything. Yeah. Taking America before the world court, the United Nations, that's like Frank James sticking you up and take your wallet, and then you go to Jesse James and tell Jesse that Frank got your wallet. And then Frank is going to ask, did he leave anything? You can't take the criminal to the criminal, fool. Rodney King should have proven that to you. Norman 3X Butler 
and Thomas 15x Johnson. He says Norman 3x Butler and Thomas 15x Johnson were lieutenants of Captain Joseph of the FOI at number seven in New York. Right. No known enforcers of Captain Joseph, according to Bruce Perry. He said that they were arrested for the shooting of Benjamin, I believe, Brown was one. All right, now let's be clear. They say, Bruce Perry, he says that Norman 3X, Brother Norman 3X, and Thomas 15X, Brother Thomas 15X, at one point were bodyguards around Malcolm X when he was in the nation. But that Malcolm, Bruce says it in his book, became leery of Norman 3X and Thomas 15X, and he felt that they were spies for Captain Joseph. And so he dismissed them from around him. Did you hear what I said? Yes. This is going to be a very critical point in a minute because it was Norman, Brother Norman 3X Butler and Brother Thomas 15X Johnson that were picked up. Brother Norman almost a week after Malcolm was killed. Brother Thomas almost a week and a half after Malcolm was killed. They were picked up for Malcolm's assassination. Now I want to ask you some logical questions. <laughs> In an audience no bigger than this audience, not even quite this big, Feb Sunday, February 21st, 1965. How could Brother Norman 3X Butler and Brother Thomas 15X Johnson, who everybody knew were lieutenants of Captain Joseph inside Moss Number 7, who Malcolm had already dismissed when he was minister over Number 7 and said he didn't want him around him, and everybody knew that it was in the news that they had been arrested for shooting the man named Benjamin. How could they walk into the Audubon Auditorium through this door right here? <laughs> and everybody not see this, or through that door right there. <laughs> Malcolm's bodyguard, many of them were members of the Newark Mosque and members of the New York Mosque. They all knew Brother Norman 3X Butler. They all knew Brother Thomas 15X Johnson. And they knew that they were strong men that would take care of business. Huh? All right. So when they walked in the door, everybody would have said, no, you're not coming in. Wait a minute. Right. You're not in here. Everybody would have said, look, it's Norman, man. It's <laughs> Norman. <laughs> can't trust it. That's real. Can't trust it. They would have converged on the door. There might have been a fight or a shootout right at the door. But rest assured, Norman 3X Butler and Thomas 15X Johnson wouldn't have walked in that door. Because everybody knew them, and they already were still, were, they were already fighting a case right then, which had come out in the media. You with me? Yes, sir. As the Bible says, let us reason together. I'm going to try to free you from the FBI tonight. I'm going to try to free you from the counterintelligence program of J. Edgar Hoover tonight. I'm going to try to loose the chains on your brain so you can see the black messiah clear and get out of the vice grip of the enemy. And the family can begin to come together and heal and build. All right. Malcolm, according to Alex Haley, according to Malcolm's assistants, and even Bruce Perry, the hour before his assassination, that Sunday, February 21st, 1965, at the Audubon Auditorium. Malcolm paced back and forth in the back room before he came out. He then sat in a chair. He said, this is bigger than the Muslim. This is bigger than the black Muslim. When I go out there today, it's in the book, both of them. He said, when I go out there today, it's in Haiti's book, too. In, in uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. He said, when I go out there today, I'm going to tell the people that it is not the black Muslims who have been making these hit attempts on my life, mm -hmm. that it is the government. This is much bigger than the black Muslims. He said, I'm going to reveal some of the key people that I think are involved. 
another brother Benjamin, I don't know if it's the same one or not, <coughs> was introducing Malcolm. And as he introduced Malcolm, Malcolm stepped out. Malcolm stepped out to give the greeting, Assalamu alaikum. And as he gave the greeting, then a diversionary tactic was used. And That's right. It was made to appear that somebody was going into the pocket of another person. And that got everybody's attention. And as they started scuffling, and Malcolm said, brother, brother, in words, don't do that, brother. As everybody focused on them, death started running down the aisles and coming out from under their coats with handguns and shotguns. Question. How did they know that they could get in that day and they wouldn't be searched? Because off and on, Malcolm's group had been searching. Malcolm had said he didn't want that kind of pressure on the people when they came out to the meetings, but off and on, they were searching. How did they know that day they could come in with shotguns and nobody would check them? There's no way on earth Norman 3X Butler and Thomas 15X Johnson could have showed up with shotguns. Even if they let them in, they would have asked them to open their coat. Because normally when they showed up, something was wrong. Right. And they came to correct it. Right. Whatever it was. Death ran down the aisle. Open fire on that. Riddled his body. Murdered him in cold blood. A man rushes to the rostrum, rushes to the podium, mm. leans over Malcolm, starts giving him what appears to be artificial respiration. That man is Gene Roberts. Spike talks about him in his movie, and Spike didn't even know who he was. He called him Brother Eugene. <laughs> Maybe by now somebody has pulled Spike's coat, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> somebody has pulled his coat. <laughs> Brother Eugene. Eugene Roberts is an F-B-I-H. Yeah. Let's go here for a minute. Okay, this, uh, <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I want to, you to reason with me on this. Undercover agents and policemen were in the audience when Malcolm was killed. Question, why didn't they jump up with their service revolvers and engage the assassins in open gunfire in the Audubon Auditorium? How do we know they were present? Let's see. Good question. A high police official said, as reported in the Herald Tribune, February 24, 1965, that several members, how many? Several members of the highly secretive Bureau of Special Services boss were present in the audience at the time of Malcolm's killing. According to police officials, there were policemen outside also. A patrolman was stationed outside the ballroom. The New York World Telegram reported February 22, 1965. A high police official, after confirming, after doing what? Confirming. That police agents were planted inside of the meeting, added, and there were a couple of uniformed men outside the Herald Tribune reported February 23rd, 1965. Deputy Police Commissioner Walter Arm said, February 22nd, 1965, that a special detail had been assigned outside of the ballroom. Assistant Chief Inspector Harry Taylor, in charge of the Manhattan North Uniform Police, said February 21st, 1965, that two sergeants and 18 patrolmen had been stationed in the area. The New York Times reported on February 23rd, 1965. Again, question. If the police were present, a crime was being committed, why didn't the police jump up in the audience with their service revolver and attempt to arrest or engage or kill the assassins of Malcolm X, or the would-be assassins of Malcolm X. Gene Roberts leans over him, pretends that he's giving him artificial respiration. Eugene Roberts, a member of Pulse, and Bruce Perry interviewed him and tells you in the back of his book very definitely that Eugene Roberts is an undercover agent. Bruce Perry admits it in his book. But Bruce Perry tries to say that the United States government had nothing to do with Malcolm's murder. Nothing. He's sure of that. That the government conspiracy 
theory, he calls it, holds no water in words. Man. But these questions I'm asking you, I know they hold some Yes, sir. I know they make you think. <laughs> How do we know Eugene Roberts other than the fact that now it's admitted? Because when Brother Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were killed in the Black Panther Party in Chicago, Eugene Roberts popped up in the trial of the Black Panther Party. Yeah, all right, now. How do we know agents were in these organizations? Because when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed by the government, it was an FBI agent and informer that were informants that were seen leaning over him, bending over him, pretending to be giving him artificial respiration. Come on. Read Mark Clark and Dick Gregory's book, Code Name Zorro, no, on no. the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the government's role in Dr. King. All right, wait for the Huh? That's right. Now, here's another key point. Reuben Francis, who had just come into the movement a few weeks ago, was supposed to be one of Malcolm's top bodyguards then. He just showed up. You with me? Tom or Talmadge Hagen, or Talmadge, a.k.a. Hayer, who is one of the admitted assassins of Malcolm, who was not a Muslim, was not a member of the Nation of Islam, but claims he is a Sunni Muslim now, and who testified in open court that he, had, that he did not know the other brother and that they had nothing to do with it, the one that was picked up a week on, later, later, and the other one that was picked up a week and a half later. Talmadge Hayer, a.k.a. Hagen, was seen shooting Malcolm That's right. by Reuben Francis, Malcolm's bodyguard, who had just joined up with them a few weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> As Talmadge Hayer is making his getaway, Reuben Francis, uh, first Eugene, what's his name? Robert, throws a chair at him. Please. <laughs> Reuben Francis shoots him in the leg. Yeah. Why didn't he shoot him in the head? Why didn't he shoot him in the back? In the chest? He shot him in the leg. Talmadge Hayer, or Hagen almost gets away. But the crowd grabs him and starts beating him. Right. Almost like magic. The two patrolmen rush to him, rescue him from the crowd, throw him in a, a car, and speed off. But they also catch another one. I brought the newspaper to with me. I went and did them, got the microfilm, went all in and got everything. Yes, sir. I got all the papers that came out here. I was ready for this chapter. I got them all. I went in right in New York and did the research. Mm -hmm. All right. When the newspapers came out, there were three daily newspapers in New York at that time. How many? Three. How many? Three. There were three daily newspapers at that time. All three of them said two men were captured at the scene of Malcolm's murder. Mm. That was the headline of the paper. Yes, sir. Two men. They even named the patrolman Hoyt, who arrested one of them and whisked him off to one of the major po police precincts, I believe it was Wadsworth, and said that all of the top brass converged on that precinct to talk to him and to interrogate him. But brothers and sisters, do you know what? When the next issue of the newspaper came out, all three of the newspapers dropped the second mystery man from their story. And all of them said one suspect was arrested in the murder of Malcolm X. What happened to the second one? All right. Who was the second one? Why did all of the top brass of the police department converge on that precinct to talk to him? Mm -hmm. And since maybe that was a mistake, Bruce Perry said. And if that was a mistake, why didn't all three of the daily newspapers, including the New York Times, why didn't they issue some kind of explanation to the people since they said it was two? There was one newspaper, the New York Herald Tribune, mm -hmm. one of the main ones. I want to talk to you about the New York Herald Tribune. Oh. 
This is the New York Herald Tribune. But that's not what I want to talk about. <laughs> I want to talk about this USA Today, September 1979 article on mass media, CIA perversion of domestic news. It says the sweeping involvement of the Central Intelligence Agent in the domestic press has not really been understood. Dozens of articles have appeared detailing the CIA's use of the press as a cover for its agents. As a cover for what? Agents. For its agents. In, uh, it goes on to say, CIA Director Stanfield Turner admitted that the CIA was doing this. In print journalism, the actions of the CIA-owned Forum World Features provides an equally suspicious picture. Forum World Features were founded in 1950, was founded in 1958 as a Delaware corporation, ostensibly owned by John Hay Whitney, publisher of the New York Herald Tribune, whom CIA sources have described as a witting participant. Mm -hmm. Forum pointed out that the CIA has 30 domestic newspapers that they use, including the Washington Post, among its clients. Mm -hmm. That means that the CIA, it goes on to say they own radio stations and television stations, and they own over 30 newspapers, and they named this particular newspaper that means that they can cover anything they want to cover. Mm -hmm. Cover. Change any story they want to change. Right. Put anything out to the public yeah. that they want to put out. Right. right. It's USA Today, September 1979, on the control of the CIA over radio stations, television stations, and newspapers. All right. Not only that, but Harper's Magazine, April 1984, lets us know that the United States government goes all over the world killing world leaders and setting up assassination right. plots in nations all over the world. Harper's Magazine, April 1984. 1963, coup Cuba, attempt to assassinate Fidel Castro, unsuccessful. 63, Dominican Republic, organized military coup to overthrow the government of Juan Bosch, successful. It goes on and on and on. It gives us year after year of the United States government going into other nations and killing world leaders. Why would they leave the leader of a black organization alone right inside of the United States if they would do it all over the world? Right. The last point on Mecca. Yes, Malcolm went to Mecca, but Malcolm had been to Saudi Arabia in 59. That's Bruce right. Perry talks about it in his book. That's right. What did Malcolm see in 64 in Mecca or in Saudi Arabia that he didn't see in 59? Let's say Bruce Perry says in his book Come that on. when Malcolm came back, from Saudi Arabia in 1959, he says he didn't see any white people. Bruce Perry says that. I want to give you the page. That's right. So that when you start your study groups, you can go right into it. That's all right. As you start your study groups, he points out and quotes Malcolm as saying that there were no white people there when he was there in 59. That was a time when white people were not permitted in that area at all as they were not permitted in Kemet or Egypt. That's why they called it the Kemetic Mystery System because white people were not allowed in the inner circle of Kemet or Egypt at that time as was at a time in the sacred precinct of Mecca. I can't go into the deeper details of Mecca and Islam and Christianity and Judaism as I wanted to, but Malcolm, you are told, found the true Islam there. Well, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that Islam and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, that Islam, Christianity, and Judaism come from the soul of the black man and black woman. That's yeah. right. Come yeah. from us. Yeah. There would be no Islam, no Christianity, and no Judaism. That's right. I saw racism all over Mecca. Right. I've been seven times. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Seven. Malcolm is El Hajj, was El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. Mm -hmm. Question me on that uh, title or credential also. I'm El Hajj too. Mm -hmm. What year did you go? Find out for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> go to Mecca. Right. Come on, brother. They got pictures of Malcolm and there's a snag or two boy. You get one like that on me when I was growing up, when I was not shaving my head every day. You'll work for it. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, 
all Muslims face the Qibla, which is the spiritual center, and at that spiritual center is what is called the Kaaba. In ancient Kemetic teachings, when you study the Medunetar, the hieroglyphic, Kaaba means the Ka and the Ba, the spirit and the soul. We believed in the Ka and the Ba before there was ever a house built in Mecca called the Kaaba. That comes from the nature and the soul of the black man and woman. We always believed in the one God. That's right. No matter where you find us in Kurukuru, Shango, Oshun, Ogun, Yemon, Ja, Obatula, Ile, Ba, Pata, Amin Ra, Amin Atin, Asa, Aset. We always, Chuku, we always believed in the one God. So understanding this, then you should understand that Malcolm must have had another purpose in mind. Bilal, the Ethiopian That's slave. Nobody taught Bilal Islam. That's right. Nobody taught Bilal the black slave. Please. There was a slave of the white Arabs who are imposter Arabs. Yes, sir. And the white Jew, the white Hebrew, the imposter Jew. You are the true Jew. You are the true Hebrew. You are the true Arab. That page was on page 206, but there were no white people in Bruce Perry's book when Malcolm went over. That's a quote directly from Malcolm that Bruce Perry admits in his book. Brothers and sisters, inside of Mecca, when you study it, you'll find that Bilal had never met Prophet Muhammad. He was a slave. Read Dr. Chancellor Williams' Destruction of Black Civilization. You'll see how that whole area changed from black to brown to white. Right. There is no Middle East. Don't let anybody tell you there's a Middle East. If they tell you that the Middle East is Northeast Africa. Yeah. If they tell you there's a Middle East, then you ask them, where's the Middle West? Where's the Middle North? Where's the Middle South? Right. And if they're too crazy, they ask them, where's the Middle Middle? <laughs> from the mainland of Africa by a man-made ditch called the Suez Canal. If you want to call that land Africa today, named after a white man named Africanus, unless you understand the kinetic root of a kepra, that means the birthplace or the place of transformation and rebirth. If you don't know about that, then you should shut up. Because Africa is a white name. Right. You put down America, put down one white name, and picked up two white names. African American. <laughs> you ain't not no African American. You're not any kind of American. Right. You got that from Messy Jesse. got that from Jesse, that African-American. <laughs> Bilal already knew about the one God. The real land question hasn't even come up in the Middle East. They talk about this so-called Arab, imposter Arab, and imposter Palestinian, or, 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 or Jew. The real land question, the land belongs to us. He was driven from the centers of power. And these lords of people from Europe came in and took over our religion, culture, God, and everything. Bilal believed in the one God. They were dragging him in the sun, beating him and punishing him because he wouldn't, he wouldn't bow down to the idol gods in the Kaaba. Where did he know about him from? If he was from Ethiopia and had never met Prophet Muhammad, it was coming up out of his genetic memory. <laughs> it's his nature to believe in the one God. Right? When they finally brought his freedom through Abu Bakr, then he had a unique way that he prayed and called the faithful to pray. So they went and told the prophet that. The prophet said, bring him to me. Bilal went to the prophet and taught him. The prophet did not teach Bilal how to call the prayer and how to pray in that special way. They told the prophet about Bilal. So the prophet said he heard Bilal, he had a vision, and he heard Bilal's footsteps going into paradise or Jannah ahead of him. The prophet said in one hadith that black people would go into Jannah or paradise ahead of all the other people. 
Inside of Mecca is what is called the Hajar or the Aswan or the Black Stone. Right. All of the pilgrims kissed the Black Stone. Yeah. Right. Mm. But six miles outside of Mecca in Mina are three white pillars. They won't even put the white ones inside of Mecca. And all of the pilgrims gather 49 stones in the valley of Moose Delta and they stone the shake the white devil. They kill the white devil. Malcolm went on that ritual. All right. Malcolm understood all of that. All of the pilgrims kill the white devil and they kiss the black stone inside of Mecca. <laughs> Malcolm, brothers and sisters, did not really change that much when he went to Mecca. But Malcolm wrote to the civil rights leaders while he was over there so that he could come back and become the popular leader of the civil rights movement. Mm. But he had to build a new platform and a new base because he had spanked the civil rights leaders so hard over the years. Right, right. So he had to write them and tell them, I changed. I changed. Integration can work. Mm. Malcolm was not a ritualist. Malcolm was a realist. Right. And Malcolm knew that just because it worked during a ritual or a ceremony in Mecca for a few days, that when everybody put back on their traditional clothes and went back right. home, a nigga was going to be a nigga all right. over again. Right. Malcolm understood that. So whatever Malcolm saw in 64, you can believe he saw it in 59 when he went to Saudi Arabia. Right. But why did he talk about it in 64, but didn't talk about it in 59? These are questions you have to ask yourself. And so now I'm really finished. And I thank you for being as kind and as attentive as you have been. There's so, so much more to be said, but we want to at this time. Uh, as you have been as attentive as you have been, and it's very hot in here, to thank you for your kind attention. I hope that in some way, no matter how small, I hope that you have learned something tonight that will pull us closer together and give us a better understanding of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, Minister Malcolm X, yes, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and our liberation and salvation struggle here in the hells of North America. Thank you for listening. That's why I spent time proving that they couldn't have been there, that they couldn't have gotten in. These two men were innocent. The ones who killed Malcolm, Talmadge Hager, a.k.a. Hagen, tried to give the judge and the court the name of the conspirators who were responsible for Malcolm's murder, and the judge cut him off and told the jury, told the stenographer, strike that from the court record. Said that he was only covering for his Muslim accomplice and that he was trying to take the weight all by himself. Another point I didn't get to raise is that brother, I don't know if his brother or not, Reuben Francis, the so-called bodyguard of Malcolm, who had just joined a few weeks earlier, who shot the uh, Talmadge Hager or Hagen in the leg, was in prison on a firearms charge from that shooting that day. They never took him from prison under guard and brought him to court for him to testify when he was supposed to have been an eyewitness but they never brought him to the courtroom at all. His, his testimony, I'm sure you would all agree, could have been a very key testimony. Malcolm's bodyguard, who shot one of the men at the scene, was in prison for the same weapon that he shot him, shot him with, shot the uh, Thomas Hayer with, but they never brought him from prison under guard to appear in court. Okay, I got one more question too. I read the books, I read it. Now we try to take one question from each, but I'll go on with brothers. Okay. Uh, in the book, uh, Malcolm X speaks that he had went to Elijah Muhammad's house 
And as he was there, it was two sisters that were trying to get to see the messenger because they were pregnant by the messenger. And that they had told him that they were trying to get money for the two children that they had by the messenger. And that's so, that was the point that's supposed to hurt their mouth so bad that he went back to his wife, Betty Sabat, all broken up about the situation, about the two sisters that he had met at Elijah Muhammad's, Elijah Muhammad's house in Chicago, in the book. Bruce Perry makes mention of that. Spike Lee has that in his movie. My study and research does not bear that out. My study and research with some of the ministers who were around that time, some of them who were responsible for making the payments to the wives who had children for the messenger and for helping to take care of them, they tell me, I know at least one, two of them who are ministers now, one in Chicago and one in Los Angeles, and they say that the payments were made on time. One of them said he used to write the check and used to deliver the check. The one in Chicago says that. So we don't know what could have happened in a case like that. We don't know if there were circumstances that caused that one time for the check to be late or for whatever assistance to be late. We don't know. And we don't know if the sisters got irate or the sisters got emotional. We don't know what happened really in a situation like that. But that's not what really hurt Malcolm. See, this is what makes me sick. Bruce Perry and some of these others want us to believe that Malcolm got so hurt because he found out that his teacher was so immoral. The other point I didn't mention, my God, is that if, even if a person doesn't believe in the Bible or the Holy Quran, I didn't even go into the Bible of all of the great prophets in the Bible who had more than one wife. But if you don't believe in Bible nor Holy Quran, what about African tradition and African culture? Malcolm went to many countries where some Oba, some Oni, some kings and rulers have a hundred Iyeba or a hundred queens or wives. And nobody criticized an African king for having a hundred wives. They look at you like a fool if you go over there criticizing an African king for having more than one wife. Malcolm understood this. But Malcolm had some personal reasons because of personal pain. Nothing to do with him observing his leader from a perspective and a vantage point that he had not observed him from previously and he was so shaken and his foundation was so destroyed. That's not what happened. But that's the party line that's put out there. Any point that Bruce Perry is on, you should weigh it very carefully if he advances my sister. Has an unidentified suspect ever been found or? No more talk about the other suspect that was in all three of the headlines of the New York Times, including the New York Times, and dropped out of the headlines in the very next issue, all of them conveniently, no explanation, nothing. And there's no way that did no one give any information to try to... impossible. It could have been an FBI agent. Could have been an undercover agent. That's why I read the information on the CIA owning radio stations and television stations and over 30 newspapers and the main newspaper that was quoted was one of the papers that they said was a witting participant in other matters. So you know if they needed to use that paper for that purpose, they could also use it for that purpose. You know if they want to advance certain information that would be negative against the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, they've got a media apparatus to work the CIA does, electronic as well as print media. But can you speak loudly, ma'am, so everyone can hear after Malcolm, after Malcolm came back from Hodge in the Middle East, did he still have, and so what did he still have also, did he still have the same view that the white man is the devil, or did he feel different about those white Muslims who were in the Middle East? Well, I've been seven times, and I saw some white folks. Even the Arabs are white. They're not the true Arabs. And they are as racist as they can be. I've got them to fight in Metro. At the airport, where I saw white Arabs take six, uh, 70, 80, 90-year-old blue, black Nigerian sisters, elders, and grab them and snatch them and throw them across the airport. I couldn't speak a word of Arabic before she left his fingertips. I was on his behind, snatched him up, and threw him up against the wall. I've seen white Arabs come out 
with bread in their robe, with black people begging in the street, and they take the bread and throw it up in the air, let it hit the dirt, and make black people stir in the dirt again. I didn't say it on the tape, but I wish we could add these things in the question and answer period to the tape. But our leader in teaching, our leader in teaching, That's right. the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I and mean, in some cases I've traveled with him. We've been all over the world. In some cases I've traveled independently. I've been to socialist countries, communist countries, and wherever the black-white dynamic existed, I saw the white communists, the white socialists on top, and the black communists and the black socialists on the bottom. All right. I've been to Jew countries, and wherever the black-white dynamic existed, I saw the white Jew on top and the black Jew on the bottom. I've been to Christian countries, and I saw the white Christian on top and the black Christian on the bottom. I've been to capitalist countries. I saw the white capitalists on top and the black capitalists on the bottom. I've been to Muslim countries, Mecca and others. I saw the white Muslim on top and the black Muslim on the bottom. It makes no difference what the social, political, economic system is. Wherever the black-white dynamic exists, the white is on top and the black is disrespected and on the bottom. Mr. Black. Yes, sir. Um, I've just enjoyed uh, the lecture tonight. Um, I'm 20 years in the struggle myself, you know, shot in the face and everything, and um, uh, Malcolm will always be on my wall. Um, he's my hero, you know. Uh, my question is now, um, do you plan to um, publish these facts based on the fact that it is as you say, and I agree with you, um, if, if we could say what you're saying um, is in fact the uh, situation as it exists, to publish this so that there can be some kind of um, unification. I thought that was truly interesting how you said Malcolm is the uh, pivotal point upon which you know the uh, black liberation movement can um, coalesce. Uh, based on his standing and how, you know, things kind of like um, went in several different directions. Um, I, I kind of like uh, thought that was truly interesting. Gave me some real food for thought. Um, and so do you plan to publish that? Yeah, there's a sister sitting right here. I, wish she left, I hope she left her number with somebody. But she challenged me with that just a second ago, which just really hit me. And then she said she would leave her number. I hope she did. I have it. And Brother uh, First Officer here has it. And uh, that was what she said. You've got to print some of this. You've got to publish some of this. So I'm not going to be the black Bruce Perry. So you don't have to worry about that. I'm not going to trash Malcolm. I'm not going to do that. Trash Malcolm. We draw from his poverty. And learn lessons from the negatives. None of us are perfect. We all stumble. But the African proverb says to stumble is not to fall, to stumble is to move fast, to yes. move forward fast. Yes. Yes. I think what we're saying what was very important about the direction of the distortions, like when you brought up the fact that the um, police officer that he interviewed was actually the officer at that time and took the report. If you just read the book, you'll think that a lot of Bruce Perry's uh, witnesses and people that he went to get his information from were credible because he lists their names and their addresses. But I want to go back and find out how credible are these people? You know, how credible is a white police officer right. at the scene of the crime? And I'm thinking that not that you have to do like the Shahara that Ali hockey by the booty thing, but I think that someone does need to go back and look at true. all the information he's putting forth to say that look, you just can't dope the masses and list a hundred references and think that we're going to buy this as scholarly research. I don't, find, I don't find that to be scholarly to go back and get a biased, an uh, obviously biased opinion from someone. That's I don't a think good a lot of people Let's look at some of these witnesses. Right. How credible would they be in a court of law yes. by this cracker? Would this cracker, Bruce Perry, accept a convict who spent six years as a cheap burglar with Malcolm named Malcolm Jarvis Malcolm went on to transform his life. Malcolm Jarvis never changed. Right. Probably envious of Malcolm, jealous of Malcolm, hates the fact that everywhere he looked, his main man, who he used to as a teenager, 
chase the white girls and rob and burglarize with and set up in the penitentiary with his main man from, from his adolescent years is now a big hero in the world. So some cracker come to him, slip him a few dollars like they did Ralph David Abernathy on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Come on. And the walls came tumbling down. Give him a few dollars and say, look, Malcolm Jarvis, look, tell me about Malcolm. He said, man, Malcolm wasn't so and so, so and so, so and so. Look, man, Malcolm used to such and such and so and so, and that was Reverend Witherspoon. He used to go, Reverend Witherspoon was a homosexual, and we used to do this. Look, look, let me tell you about Malcolm, man. Look, you want a drink? Let me tell you. Want a hit? Let me tell you. He said, no, Malcolm, I don't hear the, I don't know if Bruce don't know does. I don't know. But how can you trust these people? All of these people. He went back to Malcolm's prison <coughs> record and got the name of people who were in the joint with him and tried to find as many people as he could. I say whatever Malcolm X did during his teenage years and early uh, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, whatever he did, so what? Once he became a Muslim in the nation of Islam, oh, yeah. even Bruce Perry has to admit his life was totally Malcolm used to say himself, I'm one of the best examples of what Mr. Muhammad's teaching and program can do. Of what America has done to me and what the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad has done, has done to change my life, I'm one of the best examples. That's why Dr. Alex Haley asked him to do the book, Malcolm on himself. Malcolm went to Dr. Haley to do a book on the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And Dr. Haley told him, no, the book should be on you. You can talk better about your leader and teacher than he can talk about himself. Now, we'll come back to you in a minute. My sister. Yes, don't wait for me. Um, I wanted to ask you, why, you, why do you think that this controversy still persists? Because in the research that I've done, I was using um, the FBI file book, and in the chronology, it listed that Malcolm knew about these wives in 1955. Okay, so it just, it, that just does not jive with the fact that he would become... It took 10 years. More, it took 10 years for him to just be so outraged at this, uh, you know, this immorality that he had already known about. And also, if you could speak... Let me stop you for a second. That's the point I was making. He held it for 10 years because he really understood it according to Bible and Quran. He understood the history of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. He understood all of that. He understood Prophet Muhammad's history. He understood African culture and tradition and a man having more than one wife. But it was only when he was set down at the height of his career 10 years later that he started calling it immorality and played on the public because he knew that the public couldn't take polygamy. Some deaf, dumb, and dumb, blind Negroes couldn't take a polygamy issue. And he didn't even make it polygamy. He made it something cheap and immoral and indecent. That's right. And also in the book, it talks In the name of Allah, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, in the name of his Messiah, the black revolutionary Messiah for the liberation and salvation of the black nation, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and in the name of the apostle of the two of them, the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, we burn this book ceremoniously to say that anyone who stands up to malign, to vilify, to in any way destroy the image of those who have stood up to strike a blow for our freedom and independence, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, al Haj Malik El Shabazz, Minister Malcolm X, Congressman Adam Clayton Powell Jr. and the others, the father of Malcolm X, Reverend Earl Little, his mother, Sister Louise, and all, we burn this book to say to this cracker and to say to this devil that this is what we think of your efforts and we will not go into the Bible to buy nor to spend a penny on this crack. <laughs> and that's why Bruce Perry didn't come. He thought that after the debate, he would be out here. <laughs>